Spiritually Inspired is a sacred space for all people to explore issues of shared concern. Listen to consciously aligned guests and search for spiritual inspiration. Podcast hosts Rani Siri and Jason Barniski, yoga teachers and authors, explore and find inspiration on the path to enlightenment. Hi, welcome to our podcast, Spiritually Inspired. This is Rani Siri. And this is Jason Barniski. Today we're interviewing Yolanda Williams, who's a Reiki master here in San Diego. She's incredibly experienced, has studied in six different styles of Reiki. So we're all excited to pick her brain and, and find out more about this wonderful art of Reiki. So thank you Yay. for being here with thank us. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So first off, I would really like to ask um, for myself and for some of our listeners. I know Ronnie is also a Reiki master and she studied yes. with you. Mm-hmm. Um, but f- could you explain a little bit about what Reiki is and maybe the history of it a little bit? Yeah. So Reiki, it, in the most simplified terms, I guess it's, um, an energetic technique or it's a way to work with energy and we're all energetic. And this is an interesting question because I haven't answered it in a while. And my, my thoughts around it have expanded here in the West Um, The practice of Reiki originated in Japan. I guess I should start there. And it was brought here in the West. And so some practices within the practice itself were altered just to be able to make it more adaptable to Western culture because of the timing that it came here. So here, in a lot of ways, people view Reiki as a technique to help balance energies to help um, align more with ourselves. So for example, you know, like we are more than these physical vessels, we are energetic. And I always tell people you can think of how when you walk in a room, and you can feel the tension in the room, even if nothing's being said, we're able to feel and translate energy because we are also energetic. But what happens is our emotions, our experiences, all of these things cause us to um, clamp up or create what people call energetic blocks. And it's like a water hose that you squeeze the hose and the water starts to back up. And then you use a technique like Reiki basically to gently release that blockage or that tension or that storage of energy so that we can start to flow again in a more harmonious state so that we are more balanced within our own beingness. But what I like to tell people about Reiki that isn't talked about too much in the West is it really is a more of a technique to help us awaken to ourselves. So a lot of times here we focus on the healing aspect of healing others or working on others and forgetting the importance of awakening to who and what we are. So it really is a technique, first and foremost, that helps us to tune into identifying and finally getting to know ourselves and to realize ourselves beyond what we've been taught, beyond what we've been, you know, directed to focus on, which is always outward. So mm. it's really a technique to help us get to know what we truly are. Yeah, and that's what the Reiki level one, right? It's yeah. for self-healing. Yes, that's what I started with too, and I highly recommend. Um, just I was skeptical at first mm-hmm. too, but the more I practice Reiki, I I can sense more the subtle energy. So I can sense that every time when I drop into my meditation and start channeling Reiki, I become more relaxed, and that's what Reiki does, right? It's supposed to help you relax, and um, does it help like with anxiety? Yes. Um, so what's the, like the level, there's level one and level two. Yeah. So, well, it depends on the lineage. So more in the Western style of Reiki, there are traditionally three levels. Um, I also studied Jikid and Reiki, which is not Westernized and they have many more levels than we have. Um, but so here, uh, level one really focuses on the physical aspect. So more, um, working with physical touch, laying of hands, hands on. And then in level two, you learn how to do distant work where you don't have to be physically present 
with someone to work with them energetically. And then in level three, what we call master level, is where you learn how to attune other people to Reiki so that they can also um, like pass on <laughs> the, the, uh, this aspect to other people. To attune. To attune others, yeah. And the attunement is basically, it's really like a sacred process, this um, ritual, you could call it, between the student and the teacher. And the teacher isn't giving the person anything because we all already have all that we need. I mean, we're, we're perfect design. It's just imagine that we all have these dormant energies or these energies that have been lying dormant because we haven't been taught to focus on them or to strengthen them or to even identify them within ourselves. And the Reiki attunement, it like turns us on, like turns the mm-hmm. light on, so to speak, to um, bring us back into conscious awareness of what we are beyond just this physical vessel. And so that's why when people get Reiki attunements, a lot of people feel like they become more intuitive, they become more aware, more sensitive to energies and everything that's non-physical. And I yeah. know you just did an attunement for Ronnie. Mm-hmm. So it's a, she's the best person to ask is, uh, what is it? what do you feel like during the process? Well, I mean, and then that's, how do you just feel the, after? that's the boost, right? Because I did get an attunement a year ago, like three levels to, ma- to the master level. But every year we should get a reboot, like m- another attunement just to, uh, to kind of amplify, you know. The- what did it feel like the first time you got it? Did you notice Oh, any yeah, the very changes? first time was really affecting me. I felt I had a vivid dream for a couple of nights. And I felt like I was more connected to the trees and the plants. I would look at the plant for hours, and then I would, um, I would really like to like sit by the trees or be out in nature more, like because it makes me feel good. I feel very connected to nature. That's what the biggest thing, and I felt more like sensitive to other people's energy. Yeah, when we're in the room, I can sense like um, subtle energies that that are different in different person mm-hmm. but i can definitely sense and become more sensitive to it and then i did ask you a question back then of like what's um the difference between the two person two people who one had an attunement and another one doesn't have an attunement like how um how they can access this reiki energy because i also heard that we all of us have Reiki in it. Yes. Yeah. So Reiki, I mean, just think of that as like a title of something that already existed. You know, people have been working with energy. And again, I mean, we're all energetic way before, you know, Reiki ever became a thing. Reiki just was discovered in 1922. And I mean, ancient civilizations have been working with energies. Um, So, you know, it's just a particular way of working with energy that was taught in a very particular way, Reiki in and of itself. But yeah, I mean, people can tune into this aspect of themselves through just meditation. I mean, some people um, have like near death experiences or something that's shocking and jarring to them that brings them back into tuning into themselves. And so I think the benefit of this is speaks to even what you're saying your experience was think of like even culturally we're taught and conditioned in so many ways to focus outside of us Mm -hmm. you know what people think of us how we're um, perceived externally what we are supposed to think do want be everything is outside of us and something about this practice and any method of tuning into yourself really starts to bring you deeper into that resonance of like, whoa, what do I actually feel? What do I actually think? What is my actual experience? Mm. We don't do that. So, yeah, I mean, I believe, you know, there are so many different methods and ways that the universe leads us to waking up to ourselves, and Reiki is just one tool for that. Is it the same? Is Reiki the same energy as like prana or chi? 
So, yeah, well, so a lot of people consider it universal life force energy. And the way that I see it is like, even with our prana, um, even with, you know, chi is, you know, life force in of itself, we learn how to uh, channel it, harness it, direct it in a very conscious way. So it's not like someone just all of a sudden gave you breath. You were born with it. But once you learn how to work with the breath, you learn how to channel and move the breath, it becomes much more powerful, much more intentional because you understand how to use it within your beingness. So Reiki, it's pretty much the same thing. You're not working with some brand new energy that you've never had exposure to before. You're learning how to now tune into and channel intentionally and work with and harness and move energies that have always been an aspect of who and what you are. That's a great way. Ronnie was talking about subtle energies and Mm -hmm. what pops into my mind. I've done yoga for a long, long, long time. And so in yoga, like really focusing on the inhale and exhale, well, each inhale feels like a rise and each exhale feels like a fall when anatomically that's not really what's going on. Mm -hmm. But so the more I focused on the breath, the more I noticed the subtle energies of, of the breath. So that's a great, uh, a great analogy to kind of explain that we all have have this life force energy. Just yeah. most of us haven't tuned into it yet. Yeah. And I mean, when you think of it, we haven't been taught our true functionality in many ways, you know. And so like all of these teachings and these um, practices from, again, ancient civilizations, a lot of Eastern cultures that are being brought here are basically teaching us how to use our our natural functionality you know what I mean like we were designed for all of this there's no magic to it it's really like we're starting to become aware of our natural workings so a good question I have um and I only know this because Ronnie's done Reiki to me but um and explained it a little bit is but how is it performed Mm -hmm. and then what what's the deal with all the symbols okay are used yeah so how it's performed okay So one of the um, first things I'll say is, you know, you always hear people talking about like channeling Reiki. The more, I guess, literal way of saying that is you're allowing energy to move through you in a very um, directed way um, because you're intending to allow this life force to move through you. Although the practitioner doesn't have to try to do anything. I mean, this energy, it's intelligent just as are we so it's like spiritually guided life force energy is even how the word reiki is translated um so a practitioner can just lay hands on a person there's no body manipulation not like massage you're not rubbing them you just gently lay your hands and allow the life force to move and balance whomever you have your hands on It's going to balance them in the highest and best way for them. Whatever they allow, whatever they are open to receive, whatever that, you know, because some people do have resistance. And a Reiki practitioner, you'll sense that when someone's kind of resisting um, their alignment. The distant work is done. um, It's very meditative, even in hands-on is meditative. But when you're working with someone... uh, that isn't physically present with you. You are literally allowing yourself to almost like move outside of the analytical mind and allowing yourself to become aware of that oneness with all that exists. And you start to dissolve the illusion of separation between us and you allow yourself consciously to connect with the essence of another person. Um, Mm. And then with the symbols... Well, there's a couple of things at that. One, everything has an energetic vibration, just as we do. Our names do. Everything does. The symbols also have a vibration, too. Part of um, the energetic, we'll say, imprint or resonance of any symbol, not just Reiki symbols, any symbol. I mean, you could look at a cross, a labyrinth, anything. A lot of the, the energy of those symbols have been embedded by us you know, because of our beliefs and our intention and what we, the energy we've put into what this symbol represents. Do you, does that make sense? Do you know so what I mean? So on an individual level? But like even like culturally, collectively. collectively yeah, mm. like we have put so much, um, you know, it's kind of like, 
again, I get uh, the cross is coming to mind because it's so universal, but the, the cross. cross. And you think of how much um, teachings and beliefs have been put into the idea of what the cross represents and that, you know, culturally it's been used in a lot of ways to represent protection. Like think of even vampire movies, like everything is a cross, the cross, it protects you. It's, you know, healing, it's this and that. And our beliefs and what we attach to things really amplify the power of them. Do you see? So Mm. culturally and collectively, we amplify the power of so many different symbols. The Reiki Mm -hmm. symbols, however, (laughs) Mm -hmm. um, there are in um, Reiki level two, you are tuned to three symbols, which is, you know, the most commonly heard of. Um, One of the symbols looks very much like a labyrinth, like the spiral of going inward. Mm. And Shogure. Shogure. Yes. Yeah. And it literally, I mean, if you look at it, it kind of looks like a labyrinth. Um, Like a spiral. Like a spiral. Yeah. Yeah. And that energy, that imprint is really about that journey. And going that in. has been used in ancient. And right. So many cultures, so many yeah. civilizations. It's nothing new. And it actually mm. even can be found, um, the symbol, um, of versions of it in like Shintoism, which is a, like a Japanese, Japanese yeah, but I don't want to just call it religion, but I guess the way we would consider religion. Um, and then the second symbol in Reiki comes from um, the Sanskrit Hri, which looks very much like the second symbol itself. And there's a whole story around that about the Amida Buddha and this particular Buddha and Senju Kanan. There's a whole story around it. Mm -hmm. But basically, um, that symbol and where it stems from really is rooted in compassion. And that symbol in of itself, we work with the energy of that to help us rid ourselves of like bad habits, which goes back to our thoughts and like clearing and cleansing the mind. So it's considered like the mental emotional symbol. Mm -hmm. Then the third symbol in um, Reiki level two is what we would consider the distant symbol. And that actually was considered a, a Jumon or like a spell and it was a, a symbol that the Yusui sensei actually had created as like a spell in a way, <laughs> kind of like magic, the way we would think of magic. Mm-hmm. But it literally is like the impression of dissolving the illusion of um, separation and really connecting us with our true mind or the mm-hmm. right self or, you know, mm-hmm. what and who we are in truth. Mm-hmm. So we use the different symbols. Um, Again, it's taught in a lot of ways to use them just in session. But even from me talking about them, I hope you can see. I mean, they really do help us to go deeper into our own self-healing, our Mm self-awakening, and our own self-connection. When you're talking about the the collective enhancement of the power of that, what pops into mind was like a mantra. Yes. And so, like, I, I teach people how to use mantras Mm -hmm. and uh, I wrote a big chapter about it in my book but I talk about you don't just want to say like I want to be happy today I want over and over again Mm -hmm. there's a great power in saying a mantra that has this collective energy yeah so like a mantra would be like om mani padme om which Mm -hmm. would be a buddhist mantra that has been used for thousands of years yeah or even in the Jewish tradition would be like Baruch Atah Adonai, which is like again, 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 over and over, millions, if not hundreds of millions of people have used these collectively. So I can, right. I can grasp um, where how, yeah. how the collective energy of those it symbols builds. have built. And that yeah. was, those have been around since the 1920s? Or um, since they're the older even before? than that. Yeah, the symbols are older than that. So the third symbol, no, that may have been around the time when, you know, he 1922 but the other two symbols he they were symbols that were used in other traditions and practices so they weren't like brand new or at least they stemmed from other um symbols but even what you said it reminds me of have you ever heard of you know some people say meditate in the same spot every day because you like build up an energy in that Mm -hmm. space Mm. it's like the same thing i mean if you have this idea or intent or energy that you pour into something over and over again think of how you alone amplify the energy of this thing and now you have people around the world all 
amplifying and pouring energy into the same thing, of course it's going to like enhance mm. the resonance the of it. Yeah. yeah. Mm, I like it. That, yeah. It has to do similarly like with, with the ritual. Like if right. you were to light a candle or to to light incense every mm-hmm. time before you meditate, it's like tying a knot yes. to lock that energy in and enhance it more. Yeah. What about, um, and I know Ronnie has a great story she'll have to share with you, but pets and Reiki. I know pets are like mm-hmm. Reiki practitioners naturally. Yeah, so a lot of people do um, work with, energy or work with Reiki and animals. So some people do it because animals are so receptive to receiving it. But yeah, a lot of people also believe like their animals are already like attuned to those frequencies. So it kind of goes back to what you said before, like, can people access this ability even without having an attunement? Again, it's a natural aspect of who and what we are. It's just, we have different ways and tools to tune into that and animals, I mean, you think about it, they don't have the hang-ups that we have. They don't have the teachings and the everything that's been fed to us that would mm. uh, deter you from what is really you. Do you know? Like, they mm. have, what, what's going to make a dog not tune into himself? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you think about it, there's, I mean, they're kind of ahead of the game in us in a lot of ways because animals are so, they are tuned in and more perceptive to a lot of things that we would be naturally too, but we've been so conditioned to not pay attention. Your dog loves Reiki. Right yeah, now. I do Reiki on my dog all the time. But um, so another quick question that just popped into my head is, you said that everyone has the ability to tune in, mm-hmm. to channel this energy, but... What, then what's the importance of like getting an attunement? Like if I, I got an attunement and Jason didn't. Yeah. So what's the different in ability uh-huh. to drop in and channel the energy without like me being a, a, an attunement and Jason doesn't? Yeah. It goes back to in some ways intention because when, mm-hmm. you know, as a Reiki teacher, like I'm holding a very clear intention and it's the the process of the entombment of itself is very intentional. So that's one mm-hmm. side of it. But if I told someone, like any of us, if someone would have told me, I never studied Reiki, I didn't know anything about energy work, I didn't meditate, none of these things, and you just came up to me and said, hey, you have the ability to perceive energy and channel energy and do all of these things, I wouldn't believe it. And it would probably take me a lot more to work through and get over my own ideas and perceptions than if someone were able to kind of bypass my BS for me and mm-hmm. help me tune into it without like having to work through my stuff first. Do you see what I mean? But then that also leads to the importance of doing the work for yourself even after the attunement. Because mm-hmm. a lot of people think that like, oh, I had my attunement, now everything's great. But it's you have to... It's up to each of us to continue the work on ourselves, to expand. It's kind of like yoga, right? You learn a posture, Mm -hmm. you learn the position, but it takes a lot of practice to go deeper into that position, to trust your body, to tune into your body, to understand until you really have that one particular position like down in your way. The same is true with energy work, with meditation, all of these things. It's not a one-time thing. It's part of our own like um we expand how deep we tune in (laughs) we are the ones that have that manage how far we go into you know understanding what it even means to be energetic i was just thinking Mm -hmm. like a a good analogy would be like um, a person who goes to the chiropractor but Mm -hmm. leaves a very sedentary misaligned lifestyle yeah so they might feel great right after the chiropractic adjustment Mm -hmm. but then if they eat terrible they never exercise they always have bad posture it's going to be a one and done exactly the the, the big shift for all energy workers whether it be yoga or reiki or Mm -hmm. qigong whatever it may be is to encourage people to do their own work practice your practice that's like i should have it on a t-shirt that's what i always tell people you have to practice your practice Mm -hmm. this work is about you like i can't 
fix you. No healer can fix you. People can, we, we support each other. We hold space for each other. We give each other tools. We share, we exchange. We turn the light on for each other. But we individually have to show up and be committed to our own practice, to our own work, to our own experience. I could tell you all day, like, oh, yeah, you could do this. You're energetic. You could do it. It doesn't matter until you give yourself the experience so that you learn to trust you. You learn to understand you. You allow the energy itself to become your teacher. You allow yourself to become your teacher. So, I mean, it, I think one of the most important things in all of this for everyone to know that the work is ongoing and we're the only ones that can really ultimately do the work for ourselves. Mm. Yeah, I love my teacher, Tim's quote. And later I found out it was actually his teacher. But he said, yeah. my goal as a teacher is to inspire a love for the practice. The practice yeah. itself done consistently and right. accurately, that's the real teacher. Yes. Mm. I, I, really, I believe that wholeheartedly. And, you know, I always encourage people, go beyond the book. Because, you know, a lot of practices even I'll say Reiki specifically you know the classes they give us the foundation they give us the tools to show us that it's always been us we've always been equipped we've always had the ability and the capability but then you have to go into your practice to go beyond the foundation to go beyond just the tools and recognizing that you didn't really need them and again trusting Mm -hmm. yourself because we Again, I go, you know, we have been so conditioned to think we have to like jump through hoops and things have to be complicated to get a result. But no, it's who you are. And so I think people even uh, struggle with in meditation. People say, just sit, just be still, just observe yourself. That sounds crazy to people until they finally just allow themselves to just sit, sit beyond their discomfort, sit beyond all the noise, sit, blah, blah, blah have Mm. the experience of it and that's what like cracks the nut open or starts to dissolve the veil or you know surrender right yes and and the technique like what reiki offers is really important because without the actual technique i was thinking as you were talking about that earlier it's like everybody knows how to give a massage yeah but if you go to school and like learn for two years about anatomy and different techniques i bet your massage giving ability would be infinitely Much greater yeah. infinitely greater right mm-hmm. and that's the same for meditation or yoga or yes. anything we all have the ability but once we learn how yes. and then once you know the rules then it becomes much easier to break much, them yeah exactly <laughs> no yeah. i love that but it's it's really so true i tell everyone i think all of this is like training wheels in a way you know what i mean yeah. like we all need the training wheels at first just to trust that we can you know balance and everything's okay and then before you know you're off and running and it's like wow life changes because your perspective changes and then you have this deep respect for everything just like you said just like staring at the trees looking at nature sitting in the room with you guys having this conversation and exchanging I'm like man we're so fortunate but I don't know that I would have really tuned into or paid attention to those things before Mm. um, going through the process of tuning into what we are yeah, the pro the the benefit of Reiki is much greater than just, you know, oh, we're gonna do you know energy yeah. healing on others or. What does it benefit, or what um, symptoms could it be used to treat? I, I don't even know if that's the right way to describe it. Yeah, well, you know, there's a actually in the hospitals now a lot of hospitals, but even here in San yeah, Diego, yeah, a lot of big hospital now has yeah, Reiki. They <clears throat> offer Reiki to their patients. It started mm-hmm. off as being offered in oncology for cancer um, patients. Because it helps to alleviate pain and it helps people to relax, release tension and stress and all of these things. And because it did so well, now they offer it like throughout the hospital. So there's a lot of um, volunteers who do Reiki in the hospitals and in hospice, hospice care. Um, there are a lot of nurse practitioners and you know medical um, practitioners who now study Reiki. And in fact, you can get CEUs um, for you know, taking Reiki classes. Yeah. So it's really um, Mm -hmm. becoming quite popular, I think, partially because it is non-invasive. You know, it is very effective, but anyone can do it. (laughs) So, you know what I mean? Could it be for, like, back pain or headaches or basically for virtually any ailment? Yeah, people use it for a lot of um, 
physical pain. But then, I mean, think about it this way, because then this gets into our mind-body connection, mm. right? Mm. And once you are, say you had stress, right? We all know you could be stressed about something, then your stomach hurts or your back hurts. You get knots all over your body because of your thoughts, <laughs> because of your emotion. So you do energy work and you start to release those blocks, release those emotions. So in session, sometimes people cry. Sometimes people have thoughts come up of things they didn't remember for a very long time because it's all interconnected. So you may go into a session thinking like, oh, I'm coming because my back hurts. But what you find is that, oh my goodness, I was holding on to this grudge from like 10 years ago. And now that I've consciously allowed myself to observe it and let it go, oh man, my back doesn't hurt. So it's really interesting with the energy work. You really never know what is going to come up, what you're going to get. And I don't think that any of us could say definitively what actually causes the release of the tension and pain without like fully understanding that mind-body connection. It reminds me, one of my students, um, she told me the other day, she said that she came to yoga Mm -hmm. and meditation because she had a broken ankle, and in the process, she healed her soul. Wow. Mm, See, that's powerful. Yeah. 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 But um, also, I've heard so many stories that people actually heal cancer Mm -hmm. literally like the tumor went away after several sessions of reiki tell the story about christmas eve or the day after christmas um we were at my parents house and the dog had a stroke or a seizure we didn't know what happened the family dog after 10 years couldn't stand up couldn't walk oh wow we were like more worried about my dad because my dad is so close to this dog we're really more worried about him but the dog couldn't even get up and uh, we were desperate and asked Ronnie to do long distance Reiki. Mm-hmm. And, she, and, and I came. went into the room like that night and do like an hour of long distance Reiki. Yeah. And the next morning, the dog was just up and running, go for a walk. Two mile miles. Wow. <laughs> <Totally. laughs> Got better. That's, yeah. Yeah. It's there amazing. are so many stories like that. And I mean, I will say too, just because, you know, like our humanness, like we will put a lot of expectation on things. It doesn't happen all the time. But part of that is too, it's our allowance. And we do oftentimes have a lot of resistance and things like that. So one of the things I would say that is especially good for Reiki practitioners to know is not to put the expectation that you have to fix or heal, but more so trust that whomever you're working on, that they're going to get exactly what it they need at the time that will support them best, but also what they will allow. Because, you know, some people, they'll have a session and they're open, they're ready for it, and it's just easy. And then there are other people that have to go through several sessions to get comfortable enough, to be open enough, to let you in, and you know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. yeah, just always trust that people will get whatever it is that they need, that they're open to receive for them. I'll ask you to maybe guide us in um, a meditation technique. Okay. But before, maybe you can explain the connection between meditation and Reiki. I know Ronnie talks about how important it is for her to yeah. be very meditative and to get in that state. Yeah. But can you explain mm. the connection a little bit yeah. more? Yeah. So Reiki in of itself, I mean, the practice is very meditative because it's, again, you as the person, you're kind of like this conduit or this vessel for you know energy that's moving through you, but you don't have to control or direct anything. So you're literally just allowing yourself to be in observation of the transformation that's happening. And the more someone can allow themselves to meditate and move out of the analytical mind and just be more of like a witness, the um, <laughs> more interesting things become. So yeah, I mean, it it's very med- meditative in of itself. Um, yeah, that's it. But one of the things I do recommend for people, you know, whether or not you are familiar with energy work or you're already doing it, whatever, wherever you may be, one of the best things to do is to consciously tune in to you. And so I guess I would invite people to, if they're not driving, 
and it's safe for them to do so to get into a comfortable seated position. Um, I always tell people it's best to try to have your spine as straight as possible, almost like you're allowing yourself to tune in <laughs> to the universe, like you're becoming this antenna, and to roll your shoulders back so that you really allow that openness, that vulnerability, that connection to go deeper into yourself. And then once you find that space, just relax on the breath. You don't have to try to breathe. You're already doing it. Just let go and start to dissolve. And as you breathe, just start to allow yourself to melt, releasing any tension, allowing your shoulders to fall. And even give yourself permission to move out of the analytical mind and just be an observation of you. There's nothing to try, nothing to do. Just notice what you see, what you feel, what you sense. And as you breathe in the space, just notice where you feel your life force moving. Tune into your life force moving down your face, the back of your head. Follow your life force as it moves down your arms, down your back. And just very easily on the breath, start to see, feel, and sense your chakras open and expand from root to crown. Just observe. And as you breathe, start to feel yourself expand. Tune into that beautiful field of light that surrounds you, your auric field. See it, feel it, sense it in front of you, behind you, down the sides. And just witness that movement, that flow of life force inside of you, all around you. under the skin, above the skin. All of this movement, all that you see, all that you feel is you. Allow yourself to merge with the air that surrounds you. Just notice what it feels like around you. What does the room feel like? And as you start to tune back into your physical vessel coming back in towards the body, where do you feel sensation? Ask your body what it needs. And start to breathe your awareness right into your heart center, very center of your chest. Feel your heart start to open and expand on the breath. And allow yourself to tune into loving you. Just say to yourself, I love myself as I am.
and let those words move through you from your head to your toes. I love myself as I am. Just take one more breath and let those words expand out into your org field. Just bathe in it. I love myself as I am. And notice what that feels like. And then whenever you're ready, gently stretch into that energy. Gently open your eyes. I always tell people, wiggle your fingers, toes. Notice your back in this body. Mm. <laughs> Rub your legs. Wonderful. How do you feel? <laughs> Good. I dropped in pretty deep. How about you? I feel like I love myself. <laughs> <laughs> As you are. Yeah. yeah, so I tell people just take time to acknowledge themselves, to experience themselves outside of the physical realm. That's it. And if you do it just five minutes a day, I mean, you start to go deeper into that self-awareness without really trying anything. You're just observing you. And I think mm -hmm. that's like the key that kind oh, of... Meditation. Yeah. Self-awareness. And yeah. all of this, I mean, the foundation of all of these practices, yoga... Reiki, intuitive development, all of them are rooted in meditation, which is just about us having self-awareness and tuning in to ourselves. Yeah, and something you said earlier, not um, like, and for a long time I didn't understand kind of what helped me to get past the blocks. Because mm -hmm. I had a lot of psychosomatic, a lot of mind-body blocks. Yeah. And yeah, recently going through Vipassana, I got... A real good chance to look at those, about a hundred hours wow. to look yeah, at those yeah. mind blo mm -hmm. blocks that show up in my body. And what I learned for me, the way to get past those is just to watch them with equanimity yes. and say, this isn't good, yes. this isn't bad, it just is. And, just is. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, enlightenment, I think, is, is loving what is. Yeah. So it's just to love everything as it is and uh, yeah, and just let it go. Yeah. And then, then I was able to move on to the next one. Yeah. Well, I think the self-judgment a lot of times is what puts people in fear of uh. even doing step one of self-observation. A lot of times mm. people are afraid to witness themselves because they're already starting to judge what they may or may not see. Mm. But if you go into it without any judgment, just it is what it is, we really allow ourselves to do some true healing. And you know, we at that channel panel this last weekend, the big thing that I learned was... Uh, that judgment is, is usually trying to invalidate another's experience. So mm -hmm. when we judge, judge ourselves, we're trying to invalidate our own our experience. Own, right. So to mm -hmm. say, hey, look, I went through all this stuff, mm -hmm. and wow, I did it, and yeah. I'm still going. So really, to, it allows us to validate ourselves even more, yep. to get in touch with that, which is beautiful. Yeah. It's so beautiful, and I know, I mean, maybe we'll, another day we'll talk, but it reminds me of, you know, like, I always tell people there's so much beauty even in our shadow work and being able to sit with ourselves mm -hmm. in non-judgment, but, you know, there's a lot of fear around that, understandably, but there is um, something quite amazing and powerful, no matter if it's Reiki, yoga, meditation, whatever gets you there, the key is just being able to witness yourself, get to know you and experience you from that space of love and compassion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. We want to um, ask you a question that we ask every guest okay. that come on our podcast. Is mm -hmm. What keeps you inspired to do your spiritual work and stay inspired even through tough times? Yeah, what really inspires me is the collective. <laughs> like I, you know, have days in my personal work where I'm just like, ah, want to throw on the towel, you know, like, why am I doing this to myself? But ultimately what keeps me going is I really truly believe the more that we show up to work on ourselves, I mean, we are helping the collective. I mean, we each are contributing to this collective field that we're in. And mm. there is nothing that we do that doesn't contribute to it. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So it's like if I show up to continue to try and work to become more loving and compassionate towards myself 
and release my judgment and anger and upset around, about the world around me, that is infectious. And so it inspires me um, just for like <laughs> the sake of humanity. That's my Aquarius self, mm. I guess. <laughs> but really, like I, I, I am really truly inspired by the work that we are doing for each other together collectively and honestly it inspires me when I see people like you all as well like other people doing the work Mm. and other people you know sharing and trying to help and uplift and support it inspires me because you know it's like teamwork so yeah Yeah. I'm in (laughs) (laughs) beautiful that's a beautiful answer that's why we're doing this podcast too because we want to uh inspire you know, other people to do their spiritual work. Yeah. And now um, I saw on your website that you teach several things. Mm -hmm. Can you tell our listeners what do you teach and how they they can find you? Yes. So I teach Reiki, um, but that's only local. It's here in San Diego. But I also have several online classes. Um, One of the main ones is intuitive development. It's called intuitive mastery. But I also teach um, actually... The bulk of my classes are chakra-based. We use the chakras as kind of like an outline. And it's all really geared towards helping us to heal ourselves and to help people learn how to become observers of themselves, get past the self-judgment and all of these things, and move deeper into their own awareness and understanding. So, yeah, I have um, a lot of online classes. My website is yuchi.com. That's Y-E-W-C-H-I.com. And, yeah, I just like sharing and helping all of us wake up because we all play a part. I'll definitely have the link below. Um, you can click mm-hmm. and see the link below. I know you have a podcast, too, which Ronnie I do, and I have yeah. listened to. Um, can you tell people how to find that? Yeah, as well? so my podcast is Reiki Radio, uh, of course. No. <laughs> um, but we talk about um, just everything, really, in the realm of the same energy work and helping people to wake up to themselves. And you can find it on iTunes. Just go to iTunes and look for Reiki Radio, and it'll pop right up. And you can do Reiki, like distance Reiki, too? Yes. Yeah. So actually, the, I mean, the majority of my clients are not here. I love the distant work. So yeah, I do mm. um, distant sessions. My sessions are really a blend of Reiki and intuitive coaching. So yeah, and I, you know, you never know what's going to happen until the person shows up because of that mind-body blend and Mm -hmm. we have to see what is the real um, method of support for them but yeah I tend to do a blend so intuitive coaching is that you do like a reading Um, well I tune into someone's energetic field so I look to see I will listen to what their perspective is their point of view of what is going on for them and what their blocks may be But then I allow information to come through about whatever they may be holding in their energetic space. And so we do a blend of it's conversational in that regard, but then, you know, we'll also do energy work in a more traditional sense. And sometimes it's kind of back and forth, but yeah. Mm, And this can be like over the phone. Yeah. So the distance sessions I do on phone and Skype. A lot of people like to do Skype so we can see each other. So Mm. yeah, Hmm. it's more commonly done through Skype. Good. Is there any other questions, Jason? That's good. Meditation kind of emptied me out of all my questions. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Glad we here, didn't do that here. before. <laughs> yeah, right? At the beginning. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to close it. Thank you so much for coming Thank on. You. We learned so much more, right? Yeah, I can't. Yeah, I'm very excited. So. Well, I thank you both really for having me, for inviting me, but again, honestly, for the work that you do. Because, I mean, we are all in this together, and I think that's really the beauty of it. And there's nothing more inspiring to me than seeing others. Like, you know, we know it's a community effort, so thank you so much for the work that you guys are doing and sharing. Oh, thank Thank you. you. If you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe to stay updated on new episodes. And remember to like or comment in the section below. Thank you for tuning in and let's stay inspired together.